Anyway, okay. Um, so, I'm just going to share what God's kind of been doing in my life the past several years. Um, I believe our lives are defined by events, experiences, and things that shape us into who we become we are. My childhood was shaped very much by the people who were involved in my life, primarily my family. I grew up living in a multiracial family full of adopted children. I was always taught that adoption was a good thing, and that God favored the family with the most important things. I would probably say that I was very much your typical shelter home. I grew up going to Awana Sunday School Church, taking theology classes, and learning to defend my faith in high school competitive apologetics classes. The culture I grew up in told me that secular was bad and I shouldn't listen to pop music because the messages only exemplified the depravity of man and the world's obsession with sex and instant gratification. But when all my culture told me I should be one thing, it never really told me why, and the reason, there never really seemed to be a legitimate reason. It never felt like you were doing things for Christ. It always just felt like I had to be a certain way or the Christian community wouldn't accept me. Uh, it took, the, the community told me I shouldn't be like the rest of the world, but I was also told that I had to live up to certain standards or I wasn't a good Christian. It felt like a good ball. As high school progressed, I thought I knew the gospel, a point of why I was a Christian. But there were still, still so many things that I struggled with. Kids in my homeschool group started bullying me sophomore year and they started to shut me. I was angry, confused, and hurting. It didn't make sense in my mind. I was always trying to live up to those standards, but the same people who preached love and acceptance rejected and hurted me over and over again. In my mind, I started to understand why people might reject religion and Christianity. Suddenly, the same dark despair they songs that I heard on the radio that were bad to listen to in Christian circles, they made sense to me. The pain and the hurt were all real. I understood them. When I left home for college in Indiana, I was depressed, angry, and just wanted to start. I was still very cautious to get close to anyone, but when I did, I laid it all bare and gave myself to the end of it. And again, I was hurt. People continued to fail me, and I started to lose hope. So I moved back home. The college, college, the place where I thought it could all be fresh, was just another place that only brought pain and hurt. <laughs> so I really began to question my belief, question what my existence was in this world, and I just wanted but something kept holding me. Something kept me holding on. I wanted so badly just to end everything, to just give into dis despair, but God kept calling me to him. I was totally alone. I had no friends. Things were strange in my family. And yet so, somehow I knew God was there. So I started writing. I started writing songs, letting the pain be written into these lyrics. And as I wrote, I started seeing just how hopeless I was. I started seeing that the reason secular music was a problem wasn't because it was about struggles with addiction, lying, cheating, etc. We all struggle with that. We're all sinners. But it was because there was no hope offered, and I wanted hope. I knew the gospel in my mind, but I didn't really understand until that time that I needed Jesus. It was while I was writing those lyrics that I really wholeheartedly accepted it. I accepted that he came to heal the sick and the broken. He came to give peace to the weary, and that was me. I always knew he was a sinner. But my pride never really let me accept Christ. They kept telling me that if I did all the right things um, and was a good Christian, then I didn't really need Jesus. But no, I was the broken. I needed someone to save me from the constant mistakes I made with people, who bringing up friendships and relationships. But even despite all my sin, all my shortcomings, I had someone who never, ever failed me. Even when I constantly failed him. Even when I felt so alone in the world, I had Christ. It gave me a hope and purpose. I didn't need to do anything. I just needed to sit in his presence and accept his everlasting forgiveness and peace. And this verse is, um, or these three verses are a verse that really encouraged me, and um, I just wanted to share it with you. Romans 5, 6 to 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. I certainly hope uh, whatever has happened and come what may, um, that you, there, there's a quality, um, 
to, to the, your spirituality um, that is resilient in the fray. Um, the passages are going around. On the back side, you'll see uh, something of a drawing from my five-year-old William. We printed out 50 of these to hand out at fall conference as his greeting to you. And uh, yours truly, a derelict father that I am, <laughs> forgot to bring them out of the printer tray. I, I forgot to take them out of the printer. <laughs> so what I did, and I apologize. I mean, William didn't remember even the weekend. He was so excited to be there. But <laughs> I uh, used them on the back side. Uh, so he, I, I, I tried to get from him what this is. The front on the, on the thing right here is like a guy on a ladder going up here. Something to do with police. And an airport and a and a and a and a, like a prison truck. So they're, he's not. Hope, don't read into that. He's an unhappy kid because the frown. Okay, don't don't report me to social services. He's a happy kid, but I think he's just doing the whole Lego City bad guy thing. And that there, you can pin that up on your wall and let that kind of you know the work of a five year old. You know that's kind. Of, uh, of course, when I showed this to William, everybody was there. Andrew got jealous. So next week, what you might get is something from Andrew. <laughs> um, but, you know, so <clears throat> straight from, you know, uh, authentic authorship, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> back on the front side, uh, what use is the Bible anyway? We're kind of uh, plugging along a, a Bible in a nutshell in our preliminaries. Uh, we're, we're, I, I'm trying to talk about, in, in a multi-stage, uh, started uh, a week, the week before fall conference, the nature of Scripture, um, the nature of Scripture before we go kind of leapfrogging through the canon and going to try and tackle this question of the Bible in a nutshell throughout the rest of this year. But I'm trying to um, leapfrog through some various texts, what the Bible says about itself, the influence it's, it's supposed to have on a person's mind, on a person's um, being. Um, and uh, in so doing, I'm trying to lay down some cover fire as I'm saying, like just kind of, just kind of um, masking fire so that, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of covered my bases and then throughout the rest of the year you can snipe back at me. <laughs> um, but yeah, seven, 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17, if you're familiar with scripture, this is probably not something that's unfamiliar to you. Um, what use is the Bible anyway? You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, yet from them all, the Lord rescued me, rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What use is the Bible anyway? I hope you can see where I got the question from. It's pretty much a, a, a translation, if you will, of um, the the. the, the, the the thrust of the passage in terms of its usefulness, its effectiveness. I'm not a huge fan of boxing. Not really my cup of tea. Um, the, the physicality of it, the, the, the brutality of it tended to turn me off. So I've never really been that big of a fan of boxing until I watched Rocky IV. Anybody? Rocky Four with me. Who's with me? Mario, of course, Mario. Mario. <laughs> Rocky IV. Love you, man. I mean it. Not make fun. Rocky Four. Okay, what happens in Rocky Four? It's boxing. It's, yeah, it's nice. It's boxing, yeah. All right, so uh, uh, Rocky Balboa goes up against who? The Soviet boxer. This, you know, hulking, tall, you know, totally juiced up, by the way, which is in the movie. Um, Russian. 
um, Ivan Drago. Okay, but this is not just any fight. This isn't about um, winning a prize. This isn't about bragging rights. This isn't about cash money. Um, this is about avenging, okay, Rocky avenging on Ivan, right, the death of his best friend, okay, Apollo Creed, who in an exhibition match lost to Ivan, but, 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 but Drago laid it into him, and he died. Okay, so this is not like just, this is not Rocky 1, right? It's not Rocky 2. It's not Rocky, it is Rocky 4. <laughs> and <laughs> next level, I mean, you thought, it's like kind of 24. Like how, how much more amped up can this get? Okay, it's Rocky 4. Um, and the music, what's the sound, what's the mainstay music? Anybody know? Trivia question. No, 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 actually, that's yeah, that's the earlier one. Good try, good try. <laughs> Hearts on fire. That is the training sequence. You want to know that you want to see the training sequences of training sequences, <laughs> the training sequence of training sequences in movies. It's Rocky who's in the middle of God knows wh where Siberia. Okay, training for this match that's going to happen in Russia, in the Soviet Union. This is the 1980s, I think, right? 1980s. Okay, in the middle of the Cold War, right? So the whole, like, American versus the Soviet, right? The whole thing is, like, geopolitical. Um, the weight of these two countries, like, um, mano y mano. And um, um, Hearts on Fire is, oh, my goodness. Okay, I'm sorry, folks. Kanye doesn't hold a candle. I mean, you want something to, to, to psych you up. <laughs> Listen to Hearts on Fire. Yeah, Chris is shaking his head. Kanye is uh, Jesus reincarnate. I get that. But... Hearts on Fire. When I was preparing for this sermon, I listened to it, and I, my heart just leapt. It really did. And I was just like, I was Rocky Balboa. I know, insane. I have, you know, look, look at me, right? You know. <laughs> Aging and all the rest. Okay, but like, for a brief moment, and I played it on repeat. I must listen to the thing 20 times. I am not ashamed to, to confess this to you. Okay, I must listen to repeat like 30, 40 times. And it just like, oh my goodness. What was I doing? Oh, I was preparing a sermon. That's right. Um, um, Rocky, when he goes to Siberia, I mean, this guy is literally chopping down wood for his training. And then he's taking that wood, putting it in, like, sacks of wire, and then lifting the wire over a pulley to train, like, whatever it is you do that motion <laughs> to train your muscles. He's only got, like, a sled full of rocks behind him in the snow, and he's, like, crawling. And the whole time, Hearts on Fire is playing. All right, and the opposite is who? Ivan Drago, who's in this like fully teched out laboratory. He's got tubes down his mouth. They're measuring his heart rate, his EKG, whatever else, you know, moisture control, you know, the whole thing. And the idea is like this big, like mechanistic, automaton Soviet guy versus like the scrappy, the grassroots, kind of all he needs is a tree and some rocks. <laughs> Building this whole thing up, um, the end of which you can probably guess. But it is absolutely inspiring. <laughs> it is absolutely inspiring. And I don't care you know, what you make of Star Wars or Harry Potter. Quidditch, folks, come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> Quidditch? <laughs> gone. <laughs> I've offended everybody and your mothers, I'm sure. Boxing, who knew? Um, you watch that movie and I, I would, I would really, you have to be the most callous, like, person not to let that movie inspire you. Why do I bring this up? All scripture, verses 16 and 17, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man, taken universally, man or woman, of God, may be complete, equipped for every good work. God hasn't given us the Bible as a cruel tool, <laughs> as this, like, shame-inducing instrument that he dangles over our heads and see, you should have read it. You should have read it more this week. I know it was a hard week. You should have read it more. You know, your prayers should be a little bit more precise with regard to the content of the Bible. Uh, you should be sharing this more. He doesn't do that. 
Okay, the, the sense of this text and what it says about itself, the Bible, the nature of Scripture, is this, it's to, it, it is an inspired document. God has breathed into it the very words of life. And his intention in giving the Bible uh, to you and to me is to, is to vivify, reanimate us. It's the smelling salts so that we can sense it again with all five senses, with our minds, with our hearts, what it is, the love of God, come to earth (laughs) for you and for me. What it is, the commitment of God, the promise of God, always and forever, never to leave, never to forget, never to fall asleep. Um, It's inspired My words here, it's meant to give life through the good news it brings of the forgiveness of sins, training us in a biblical sense to read the words of Scripture and find there the love of God for a weak, for a broken, and for a rebellious people like we tend to be, like we have been. What kind of teaching might Paul be talking about here in verses 6? What kind of training? What kind of reproof? Mm, That's interesting. That's just a loaded word, right? I mean, we hear reproof. What kind of correction might Paul be envisioning in what he's talking about? Whatever it is that might occur to you in your mind's eye what Paul means, set that aside for a second. Can you not see that this is sort of a training where we're to tap into the words of life, for they are the very words of life, um, training and reproof and correction in, the do- in, in what we call the doctrines of grace, training ourselves always to think of God as a loving God who forgives sins in Jesus over and over and over again. That we are a people who spur one another on. Don't forget, never mind how well that went. Never mind what lies behind in terms of a pattern of sin. Never mind what commitments you think you've made to God that at this point, only a month in for first years, you've broken and you thought you could last at least a semester. Never mind any of those things. Remember, he is committed to his people. He loves you. He's died for you. Why would we ever, why would we ever forget? This is kind of personal for me, I will share with you a little bit about my week. Basically, William went to school Monday after we got back from fall conference, and then Tuesday we sent him to school. He had a bit of a cough. And he, within an hour, we got a call from the nurse, and uh, yours truly had to go and drive to school to pick him up because he had to be sent home. Then we took him to the doctor, and what did he have? Pneumonia. Who gets pneumonia anymore in the 21st century? I thought we cured pneumonia in the 1920s. Like, wasn't penicillin sort of the antidote to pneumonia? Isn't there some kind of, obviously there's no, uh, you know, there's no inoculation against pneumonia. But he's had pneumonia all week. He's missed school Tuesday through Friday. Some of you wish you could do that. I get that. But you have to understand for mom and dad, we think we've done him wrong. I mean, he was sick for the last couple of weeks or whatever, <laughs> off and on. And then we were fall conference was like, well, he's not that sick. He, you know, he, he, there's just no way William's not going to go, right? Otherwise, I'm going to end up in the prison truck right by the airport, you know, at the, end, at the tail end of this narrative. There is no way William's not going to fall conference. I mean, come hell or high water, I mean, Jesus himself could come back, and William would not listen to Jesus. If Jesus told him, you may not go to fall conference, William is going to fall conference. And we're like, all right, dear Jesus, be good to us. <laughs> and lo and behold, you know, Jesus is always good to us, but William fell ill with pneumonia, and that meant sleepless nights. But uh, t- t- Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, William was up at 4.30 a.m., which is early for him. Um, Wednesday night, he was up from 1.30 to 4.30 a.m. I mean, there was just a ton of things where uh, it was just not going well. And it kind of knocked out the whole family. And it was a moment of weakness. Uh, this is a different sort of thing than you might be familiar with, and certainly that you're going through. Um, but it's just one of those things for parents. We just felt like, have we let our child down? Has, did daddy tow, okay, wife and children for the sake of daddy's job? Is the pastoral thing going to be something that William as the first and as the first son and the preacher's kid going to resent for the rest of his life? I mean, this whole stuff is like, all this stuff is like going through my mind. Have I been neglectful? You know? Um, and I, too, had my moments of weakness where I was teetering on the edge. Ah, Jesus, <laughs> is this true? Have you loved me? 
And I, I, you know, I, I, in some sense, I'm still wrestling with that. There have been moments of conclusion. There have been moments of epiphany. Sure, little things here and there where I've been trying to preach to myself the gospel. When you hear training, when you hear reproof, when you hear correction, I imagine you're hearing the moral dimension. Mm -mm -mm. No dancing. No. R-rated movies, which I think disqualifies Rocky IV. <laughs> uh, you know, after dark, doing things after dark. Uh, uh, uh. You know, I mean, like, you know, kind of the, whatever, the, the Amish, I guess. I don't know. You know, the, the, the kind of like the, the wag of the finger, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, and then kind of just this, um, this uh, reproof for correction. There goes the preacher again, okay? But I say no. I mean, sure, that's there. There is a sense of go and sin no more. No, no, but, but train yourself to drink, you know, deeply and unendingly from the fountain of life, from the windows of heaven, whence, you know, rains down God's lavish love all the time, over and over again, if we would only pause for a minute uh, to ask, God, are you there, you know, are you there by your spirit, and can you not, I don't know what may come with this exam. I don't know why I flopped yesterday like I, I don't know why I'm in this fight like I am with this person. Help. And, and, and in that, just the cry for help, in that expression of humility, you know, refusing to give into a lie that God won't. <laughs> refusing to kind of give into the lies that we tell ourselves that Jesus doesn't love me and never cares for me. He put me in this place, in this place so just so I could fail. How cruel. Refusing and training ourselves, looking to one another, you know, for that kind of correction, for that kind of support. That's in this about as much as anything else, if I if you if you were to ask me. We train ourselves on the life giving qualities of the Bible. We train ourselves on the life giving behaviors in fellowship with one another, the life giving language. And if you're not a Christian, right? What about non-Christians? What if you, you know, you're not really, you know, isn't there a sense, I mean, isn't there a sense, you know, these are words of death. Okay, sure. Okay, maybe. What, what if you're kind of a teetering Christian? You're, you, you doubt the hard things that Scripture says. Eddie, the Scripture doesn't all talk about love. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, but, but here's the thing. This is really hard to talk about. It's, it's more done better one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it has to do more with what you know the motives. Why, why are you reading scripture? Not what is it telling you and what do you see, especially if you're not a believer or if you really struggle with some of the things the Bible says. Why are you reading it? Is there not something about what you're hearing that's just been tainted from the beginning, presuppositionally, if that word makes sense to you, because the why of why you're reading it is misplaced? If we read the Bible for God to justify himself to us, <laughs> to defend himself for every criticism that we bring to bear to his word. You're not going to find you're not going to find there the words of life. He refuses to answer. You'll find other things, you'll find, you know, twistings of of twisted interpretations, manipulations, the lies of the enemy. You'll find all sorts of things, but if you're if you the reason why you're ask you're reading the Bible is to get from God what you think you deserve in terms of an explanation. That's a fundamental issue. And it does not make you objective. It doesn't give you that unbiased perspective to be able to read it and understand this document talks about a lot of hard things, but at the core, it reveals to us a God who is loving, who is accommodating, okay, who is condescending, not in a scornful way, who has lowered himself from the height of heaven, from the height of all power, and said, I love you. And can you, can you think and pause first about the criticisms that you might have, about the doubts that you might have of Scripture, maybe even the hostility, right? Or can you, can you lead others that you know feel this way to pause from their hostility and to think, why am I, why do I even care? <laughs> and why am I going to the words of Scripture? Bottom line, no one would watch Rocky IV, even the hardest skeptic, okay, you couldn't watch Rocky IV, hear Hearts on Fire, watch that whole training sequence and think, legalist. Right? No one could watch Rocky IV and think, oh, he's so self-righteous. He's, he's so full of himself. Who does he think he is? Rocky. Whatever. I could take him. Kanye is so much better. 
You, you couldn't do that. <laughs> there, the, 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 the picture of it is, is there's, admittedly, there, there's, there's, there's some hardship to it. Um, but, and, and okay, maybe the 1980s filmography is just something you can't get beyond, and you need more like CGI special effects. J.J. Abrams, right? <laughs> okay, fine, right? Um, but no one would look at that. No one would look at the Harry Potter sequence, right? The narrative and be like, ugh, Harry, useless. Waste of time. Why are you trying so hard, Harry? Lighten up, whatever. No. See, if you believe it, if you watch the movie, the suspension of disbelief, if you watch the movie, you're engrossed and you're like, that is a greater good and he's got to win the Quidditch match, right? And we're like, go, Harry, we'll give it all up. Even die if you have to, to defeat Voldemort. Do it. <laughs> the Bible is no different, and it's true. You don't need to suspend disbelief. Okay? What it may mean is coming to grips with our pride and our not wanting to admit our sin before God, acknowledge our weakness, acknowledge we're not all that we would like other people to think we are. To kind of untangle a little bit the, the threads of self-consciousness and self-absorption and allow Jesus okay, to speak in an unbiased way so that you might hear it in an unbiased way and then be trained, sure, for godliness, be trained, have our thoughts trained, our lives anchored in, focused on the gospel and nothing else, on the unwavering love of God, whereby we can go and sin no more. We can go and, and fight against our sin. We can go and fight against evil and sin that we find in the world. It's a hard world. We're going to talk about that sometime in the coming weeks. I've made a lot of promises that I haven't made good on in the past when I talk about next week. But the point of scripture is to, is to, is to focus us in a burning focus <laughs> on the love of God. And then we train our thoughts on that. We train our, our, our passions, our emotions on that. We look to, when we are weak, we look to God's word to remind us of the realities of evil, to remind us of the realities of sin. And then we fight all the more. One foot in front of the other. The beauty of this is you don't need to be rocky. <laughs> And be able to kind of lift this one ton like thing of rocks that you chipped off the side of the mountain. <laughs> William and priest, William in kindergarten. This is his first semester in kind first semester. I think it is a semester. This is his first year. This is kindergarten, right? <laughs> the first two weeks he's had a ton. I mean, the first two weeks he had a ton of trouble just getting dropped off. He did not want to leave. Uh, Eddie and Annie both split like every other day or every two days. We would kind of alternate. And William at the door of kindergarten just did not. We're not allowed to go in the building. It's a security issue now, right? We're not allowed to go. They don't. They can't have all these strange parents and adults wandering the hallway. So we go to the out, outer building and we let him. And he's got to walk this long hallway, about the length of this room. He's never done that before alone. Yeah. And he, I don't want to. I don't want a day. I don't want a day. I don't want to. And I was like, it's okay. You know, I'm. I'm here. I'll be here if something happens. I'm running, you know. I'm getting. I'm, I'm going to do. I'm, I'm supporting you. And at a certain point, it wasn't working. At a certain point, I got a little upset. <laughs> um, and then, and then I was like, "Well, I can't get upset. I'm just getting upset is not going to help William, kind of calm himself." And then what? 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 Annie and I figured out we needed to kind of change our tune. <laughs> we needed to change our tack. The angle we were taking was completely wrong. And so, uh, about week, the beginning of week two, I said, "You know what? I, I kind of." I squat down, I, I look him eye to eye, shoulder to shoulder, um, father to son, and I'm like, William, you can do this. He's like, I don't think I can do it. No, 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 William, you can do this. You know what? And only you, you are the only one on the face of this planet who can do this. You're the only one on the face of this planet who has to do what you have to do. And he's kind of like, but daddy, there are other kindergartners around. Like, everybody's getting off in droves. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is about William and what William has before him to do. And you can do this. And wouldn't you know it, he did it. And then the next day he was reluctant, but he was a little quicker. And then the next day he was a little less reluctant. And then the next day he was a little reluctant. And then lately this week he says, or not this week, because he's had pneumonia. But let's just say for the sake of argument, this week he's like, see you, Daddy, love you. And then he takes Miss Maria's hand and he walks down. He could do it alone too, but Miss Maria just loves him to death. 
When did you know? There were some Hispanic ladies, too, because they like, work in the... Th- and they were like, uh-huh, that's right, honey. Yes, he can do it. He doesn't need nobody. <laughs> I was like, that's right, my son. He doesn't need nobody. <laughs> it doesn't matter how big you are, how strong you are, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you've got perseverance, whether you've got biceps out, like, you know, the wazoo, you know, that, that tight-fitted shirt. You know how guys wear that? That's kind of weird, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whether you're kind of this kind of weak mental, weak frame, mentally speaking, or strong. Whether you, you fashion yourself kind of butch or kind of like, mm, and kind of a milk sop. Okay, everybody has that. You don't need to be Harry Potter. You don't need to be Harry Potter. You don't need to be Kanye. Okay? You need to listen to Hearts on Fire. Anybody can do this. Because at the end of the day, we're not training like Rocky. It's not hard. We're just trying to train ourselves to think about the love of God. Unconditional love of God. Always, there's nothing hard. Actually, the more you do this, the, 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 you, the real, you, why was this ever so hard for me? How could I ever live my life apart from? How could I ever forget walking into it, the hardest exam of my, of my time in college? How could I ever forget about the love of God? Oh, my goodness, if only I had trained myself earlier. <laughs> it's, it, it's not training yourself against what's hard. It's training yourself, like, if we can kind of unbias ourselves, kind of take... To, gradually peel away the layers of pride and self-absorption, self-consciousness, anxiety, worry for oneself, fear, suspicion, doubt. If we kind of just kind of steadily kind of peel those, tap it in as we look for these things, beg his spirit for help to read it this way. It's, it's, it's accessible to a five-year-old. It's accessible to me. And it's accessible to you. Dear Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross, for being raised to new life, for the sake of many, for the sake of us. We thank you and we praise you that you didn't just do it, but you left a record of it in writing. That we could read about it over and over again, that we can go to it whenever and wherever we need, and then some. And to take in the words on the page as if you're speaking to us face to face. Oh, that we would behold the glories of our risen king in the pages of scripture and nothing else. Uh, help us for these things, for we are weak. We, we, are, we, are, we, are, we tend to slide back into forgetfulness, into distraction, into, un, into you know, inappropriate patterns that we know Christians uh, should not be espousing. Father, breathe life into your word. And by your word, breathe life into our dead bones. We pray for your sake and for the glory of the risen Son. Amen.